do not yet know the full extent and the systemic and structural changes which will happen. However, we do know that global energy systems, food systems and supply chains will be deeply affected. Welcome to the year 2030. Welcome to my city, or should I say, our city. Boy, the uh, conspiracy theories are coming fast and furious these days. I can't keep up. I don't own anything. I don't own a car. I don't own a house. I don't own any appliances or any clothes. Uh, what we're talking about here is uh, a kind of distrust of institutions. In our city, we don't pay any rent because someone else is using our free space whenever we do not need it. My living room is used for business meetings when I'm not there. It's important that we look at what's happening right in front of us. Shopping? I can't really remember what that is. For most of us, it has been turned into choosing things to use. Sometimes I find this fun, and sometimes I just want the algorithm to do it for me. It knows my tastes better than I do by now. Control your soul's desire for freedom, it says. Any effort to succeed in delivering on the sustainable development goals. My biggest concern is all the people who do not live in our city. Those we lost on the way. Those who decided that it became too much. All this technology. Those who felt obsolete and useless when robots and AI took over parts of our jobs. I get annoyed about the fact that I have no real privacy. Nowhere I can go and not be registered. I know that somewhere everything I do, think, and dream of is recorded. You'll own nothing and you'll be happy. It's a phrase you've probably heard over the last couple of years, but what exactly does it mean? Where does it come from and what exactly is it? In this docu-series, I will walk through with you a plan, a vision, an idea that the mainstream media are calling a conspiracy theory. This pandemic has provided an opportunity for a reset. It is called the Great Reset. Why are they so suspicious of institutions? But as we try to build back from this uh, global pandemic. Joe Biden calls it Build Back Better. Build Back Better. Building back better. To do things differently. To build back better. We're going to build it back better. And build it back better. To my plan to build back better. This is an organization that profits from famine and disease, known as the World Economic Forum. With everything falling apart, we can reshape the world in ways we couldn't before. Ways that better address so many of the challenges we face. And that's why so many are calling for a great reset. This organization pushes fear and tragedies to further its own agenda. We know now uh, that um, the next crisis is already waiting for us around the corner. One that will dictate what you own, what you eat, what you think, under the guise of a sustainable future. With climate change set to dwarf the damage caused by the pandemic, the message from 2020 should be abundantly clear. Capitalism, as we know it, is dead. And when someone calls this a conspiracy theory, they don't realize that the information is right under their nose. We want to be a very tra transparent organization. In the year 2020, March to be exact. COVID-19 plagued our television screens, social media timelines, radios, and the newspapers. For the first time in a long time, or at least since the dawn of the climate scare, the entire human race was told that they were facing the same threat and was tasked to work together to put an end to it. Millions of Americans staying at home are relying on Amazon. Millions of Americans staying at home are relying on Amazon. And in the shadows, an organization, or a cabal, really, schemed to use this sudden global instability and public hysteria 
to rewrite society. We do not yet know the full extent and the systemic and structural changes which will happen. To do away with the values and systems that underpin civilization. This plot is titled The Great Reset. This idea known as the Great Reset was announced in 2014 and pledges to redefine the social construct between governments and individuals by creating a global, sustainable system through electronic identification, universal basic quality services and the reconsideration of industries such as oil and gas and even technology. But control of data might enable human elites to do something even more radical than just build digital dictatorships. By hacking organisms, elites may gain the power to re-engineer the future of life itself. Because once you can hack something, you can usually also engineer it. The book The Great Reset outlines five pillars of civilization that need to be reimagined for the desired world in the eyes of this one man, Klaus Schwab. What can we do? The group is, we are, we are just now looking what we can do for the Middle East. Um, the situation is so dangerous in the Middle East. Can Davos help to, to bring the parties again together as we have done on many occasions in the past? Can we play a constructive role? as an informal platform. These include a technological reset, a societal reset, an economic reset, an environmental reset, and a geopolitical reset. You know, for all of Trump's, of the administration's belligerent approach towards China, it hasn't actually achieved very much. Whereas I think Biden would be less reckless, maybe more strategic, and would engage on issues of mutual concern, like climate, um, and, and Biden would be better at building coalitions. Um, also, I think Biden would probably run a tighter ship. We get a sense, at least our bureau in China, that you get a sense that they're exhausted and actually they're rooting for, for a reset. The Great Reset is a global culture and economic cataclysm birthed by Schwab, the founder and executive chairman of the World Economic Forum. And you? Well, you're supposed to go along with this, really, and not be allowed to question it. Something like 1984 could actually happen. This is the direction the world is going in at the present time. In our world, there will be no emotions except fear, rage, triumph and self-abasement. The sex instinct will be eradicated. We shall abolish the orgasm. There will be no loyalty except loyalty to the party. But always there will be the intoxication of power. Always, at every moment, there will be the thrill of victory, the sensation of trampling on an enemy who is helpless. If you want a picture of the future, imagine a boot stamping on a human face forever. The moral to be drawn from this dangerous nightmare situation is a simple one. Don't let it happen. This man, Klaus Schwab, has served on the boards of the Daily Mail, Vontabel Holding, a private banking group, and served as a member of the Bilderberg Group, which is a conglomerate of the world's elite that discuss the consensus of a free market, Western capitalism, and global interests. In 1971, a particular organization was born from not just Klaus Schwab, but was spearheaded by, in fact, three people these three people at that given time were three of the most influential men of America. Henry Kissinger, who served as the United States Secretary of State and National Security Advisor under the presidential administration 
of Richard Nixon and was one of the key influential figures in the Bilderberg Group. Henry Kissinger was also Klaus Schwab's mentor where a CIA funded course run by Henry at Harvard was where the birth of the World Economic Forum came from. Yes, uh, there was um, one course, one seminar of um, Henry Kissinger, um, which really opened my eyes. I wasn't accepted to the seminar, but I sat in. I think he let me in because I was German. And, uh, and it was relatively shortly after the war, there were not too many Germans here. And uh, this created a friendship which has um, uh, endured until today. And uh, you know, uh, Henry has been several times in, in Davos. Next, we have Herman Kahn, a founder of the Hudson Institute and military strategist, and was even called the real Dr. Strangelove. Herman at the time was the leading figure in thermonuclear strategic planning, where during the mid 50s would see Henry Kissinger and Herman Kahn cross paths. And finally, we have John Galbraith, a Canadian American economist and an intellectual at Harvard. In 1945, after the death of Roosevelt and the end of World War II, John was sent to London to create a division directorship of the United States Strategic Bombing Survey, where he was tasked with evaluating the overall economic effects of the wartime bombing, later going to Nagasaki and Hiroshima to evaluate the effects of the bombings. In 1958, Galbraith became the Paul M. Warburg Chair in Economics at Harvard. This is the same position that he would hold when he would first be introduced to a young Klaus Schwab. These three men are responsible for what is now known as the World Economic Forum. We are in the midst of a crisis, a transformational crisis. The world will be quite different uh, when it comes out of the crisis. So we have two tasks. The first one is to help to manage the crisis and second to shape the post-crisis world. In the year 1970, Klaus Schwab wrote a letter to the European Commission and asked for help in setting up a non-commercial think tank for European business leaders. The European Commission would then sponsor the event. The Commission is a group of politicians, men and women, who meet every Wednesday in Brussels. We call them commissioners. Together, they form the government of Europe, so to speak. They all have their own specific field of responsibilities and come from different countries. Schwab then organized a two-week business managerial conference, and in 1971, the first meeting of the World Economic Forum commenced, held in none other than Davos, Switzerland. Around 450 participants from 31 countries took part in Schwab's first European management symposium. The project was recorded as organized by Klaus Schwab and his secretary, Hilde Stoll, who later the same year would become Klaus Schwab's wife. One of the most influential groups that spurred on the creation of Klaus Schwab's symposium was a group known as the Club of Rome. The Club of Rome is a think tank of scientific minds and elites that mirrors the World Economic Forum in many ways. We need to encourage civil society, media and political parties to embark on what I would call public education campaigns with a focus on democracy and human rights and by all means of tolerance. Aurelio Pecci, an Italian industrialist, Alexandra King, a British chemist and pioneer of the Sustainable Development Movement and David Rockefeller, an American banker and philanthropist whose family name is possibly the most notable being one of the richest families to ever live. Among the Club of Rome's first accomplishments was a 1972 book 
entitled The Limits to Growth that heavily focused on global overpopulation, warning that if the world's consumption patterns and population growth continued at the same high rates at the time, the Earth would strike its limits within a century. It was soft eugenics conceived from the fear of overpopulation. And I know what kind of world I want to live in. I don't want to live in a collapsing world. I don't want to live in a world, as Jürgen says, it's getting grayer and grayer. And it costs more and more and more to maintain even a decent standard of living. The Club of Rome would later that year publish a report detailing an adaptive model for what is known as global governance that in their terms would divide the world into ten interconnected economic and political regions. In these years, the elites that are part of both the World Economic Forum and the Club of Rome have argued out in the open for the public to see, including notable figures such as Al Gore and Bill Gates, both at the World Economic Forum, have pitched on how a contraceptive pill is a key tool in the fight against climate change, where Al Gore says, and I quote, depressing the rate of child mortality, educating girls, empowering women, and making fertility management ubiquitously available is crucial to the future shape of human civilization. Whilst Bill Gates says, and I quote, if you get the health improved, you get the availability of contraceptives, then families will voluntarily choose to have less children. It is not a secret that both these organizations mirror each other with their agendas. Bear in mind as well that Bill Gates and Al Gore both have children. They mean they want other people to have fewer children. The World Economic Forum, with all of its influence, has even started their own schemes, one notable one being the Young Global Leaders Scheme. Their plan was to spread their radical ideology through organizations and governments around the world. And the worst thing about it is it's already in play. What we are very proud of now is the young generation like uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, um, President of, Brazil, of uh, Argentina and so on, so that we penetrate the cabinets. Notable names include Mark Zuckerberg, the CEO of Meta, formerly known as Facebook, Justin Trudeau, the Prime Minister of Canada, with Christia Freeland, the Deputy Prime Minister of Canada, who also sits on the Board of Trustees for the WEF, infamously known for being the granddaughter of a Nazi collaborator, but her role in this and on the world stage doesn't end with sins of the father or grandfather. Freeland was directly involved in the crackdown on the Canadian truckers protest who demonstrated around the country, especially the convoy to Ottawa, Canada's capital. This was in protest of the Covid restrictions. Freeland greenlit a government response never before seen in the West, freezing bank accounts, removing insurances, even as far as blocking crypto transactions. But the crackdown didn't just end there. Canadians were beaten, arrested, held without bail, vehicles seized and trampled by horses. More Canadian names include Jagmeet Singh, the leader of the NDP, a radical left anti-oil party. Andrew Scheer, prior leader of the official opposition Conservative Party, should paint you a picture of just how opposing these people are. It will be a young world. It will be a digital world. Now who could represent such a world better than you? Prime Minister, to represent also a new open Canada. I want to use this opportunity also to thank our Canadian constituency, which always has been a very loyal and very much engaged constituency here at the Forum. But now I think 
with you, together with our constituents, Prime Minister, we can make sure that uh, in the future we strengthen the cooperation even more. The alumni from Europe include Emmanuel Macron, the President of France, Alexander de Croo, the Prime Minister of Belgium, Sana Marin, the Prime Minister of Finland, surprising names from America such as Tulsi Gabbard, a critique of everything the Great Reset entails, but most interestingly, Ivanka Trump, daughter and senior advisor to the 45th President of the United States, Donald Trump. They predicted an overpopulation crisis in the 1960s, mass starvation in the 70s, and an end of oil in the 1990s. These alarmists always demand the same thing, absolute power to dominate, transform, and control every aspect of our lives. We will never let radical socialists destroy our economy, wreck our country, or eradicate our liberty. Dan Crenshaw, congressman from Texas, Peter Buttigieg, the Secretary of Transportation in the United States. Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister of the United mm. Kingdom, back, who imposed a ban on ministers attending the summit back in 2020, where he said, Our focus is on delivering for the people, not champagne with billionaires. Hmm. He says that as Boris is still an active member of the WEF. Other key figures lurk within the WEF, including Jacinda Ardern, the Prime Minister of New Zealand, who continues to enact governmental tyranny upon the Kiwis. Cabinets that form policy, or offices that minister to our economy, aren't the only places this organisation has crept its way into worldwide. It's embedded in every aspect of our lives. The World Economic Forum hosts annual meetings since 1971. The richest and most influential names and faces gather in Davos, Switzerland. Because the forum isn't just for those at the top. It's also about creating opportunities for anyone who wants to make the world a better place. Every industry leader attends, and even certain individuals from the entertainment industry. Names like Will I Am from the Black Eyed Peas, Pharrell, the famous American music producer and songwriter. Leonardo DiCaprio. And not only has he starred in many blockbuster movies produced in Hollywood, but has used his platform to echo climate alarmism. If you do not believe in climate change, you do not believe in facts or in science or empirical truths. And therefore, in my humble opinion, should not be allowed to hold public office. Bono from U2, the Irish rock band, who works hand in hand to reshape global sectors. It's amoral. It requires our instruction. Capitalism has taken more people out of poverty than any other ism, but it is a wild beast, and if not tamed, it can chew up a lot of people. Rajiv Shah, the president of the Rockefeller Foundation. Any effort to succeed at delivering on the Sustainable Development Goals requires doing that in fragile states. The world does not have an effective approach to supporting fragile states in being successful, especially coming out of conflict or coming out of a disaster. And Chad Hurley, the co-founder and CEO of YouTube. Well, I think um, they're just hearing the message now that uh, the internet is truly evolving into a, a platform for communication and that they would be able to harness that energy uh, to have their views and their messages expressed to the world. The summits every year share a new theme. In 2009, it was shaping the post-crisis world. In 2017, it was responsive and responsible leadership. In 2018, it was creating a shared future in a fractured world. And in 2020, the summit named The Great Reset was hosted alongside a particular royal family member, Prince Charles which set off every alarm in the minds of those who are paying attention. And we build 
uh, again in a greener and more sustainable and more inclusive way. Was COVID the great reset? And what lies in the future of our world? I hope to answer these questions for you during this series and give you the facts and knowledge in order to resist this creeping radical globalism.